you make content on this platform, it is impossible to ignore YouTube Shorts. And so in this video, we're going to give you the complete guide on how to make them in just five minutes. Here are the basics. YouTube Shorts must be 60 seconds or less in length. As for aspect ratio, well, viewers watch YouTube Shorts on one of these, so it's vertical portrait videos. Aim for an aspect ratio of nine by 16. You can go as wide as a square format, but the more you do this, the bigger these black bars at the top and the bottom are, which is wasted space. Absolutely anyone can create YouTube Shorts. Zero views, zero subscribers. Start your channel today and get creative. You can make Shorts through the dedicated tool on the YouTube mobile app or create them using your own video editor, say on a computer. When you upload the video to YouTube, it will automatically detect that the video is a short. There are loads of ways to access YouTube Shorts these days, such as on the homepage under the Shorts section, in the subscription feed, on a channel's homepage, by searching on YouTube for Shorts on a specific topic, by typing in hashtag Shorts in the YouTube search bar, and in the dedicated Shorts tab beside the Home tab at the bottom of the YouTube app. And many of these are replicated in the desktop experience of YouTube. YouTube reports that over 50 billion Shorts are watched every single day. So for creators, that's a big opportunity. To create a short within the app, tap on the plus button at the top of the screen and then create short. This big red button obviously records footage. And as you do this, a red meter fills at the top of the screen. This is how much record time you have left. You can record as many clips as you want. And if you need more than 15 seconds, tap here to give yourself 60 seconds of recording time. This undo button will remove the last clip you recorded. And over on the right hand side, you have tons of creative features such as timers, green screens, effects and filters. YouTube are constantly adding to this, so play around with it. You can add popular music and sound to your shorts through this button at the top of the screen. You can search for what you need, preview it, and then add it directly to the footage as you record it. If you use this feature, your short will not receive any copyright claims, which means that you can monetize the short once you're in the YouTube Partner Program. You can also add clips from your phone to the YouTube short, but if these clips have licensed music in them, they may get copyright claimed because you didn't add them through YouTube's built-in tools. This X button will allow you to delete the short completely or save for later, and a tick in the bottom right-hand corner will take you to the next stage where you can do a bit more editing. For example, if you want to add text to the short, you can type it out here and then tap on Timeline to drag and trim the text so that it displays only when you need it to. There are a couple more features you can play around with here, but ultimately you'll be tapping on next in the top right hand corner of the screen to take you to the upload page. Starting with a title, this is perhaps the most important part of your shorts SEO. So make sure it's searchable or incredibly intriguing and keep it to 40 characters or less if you can. That will stop the title from getting cut off when people see it on YouTube. Next to this is an image with a pencil icon. This is where you can kind of select a thumbnail. It will allow you to scrub the timeline of a short and choose a single frame that represents your thumbnail. What you can't do is upload a custom thumbnail unless you use this cheeky hack linked in the top right hand corner of the screen. Shorts remixing allows any creator to use the audio from your video and the video too if you agree to it. We'll come back to that later. And we always recommend uploading any content to YouTube unlisted or private just so that YouTube can process it properly and you can check it. When you're ready, it's time to upload. So those are the very basics of how a creator makes a YouTube short. And if you're finding this tutorial valuable, make sure to subscribe. But what about the viewer's perspective? How do they interact with a YouTube short? Well, the truth is very, very quickly. Users can swipe through a lot of shorts because it's so easy to do. You can also do all of the usual stuff such as likes, comments, and shares. The description box is hidden away a little bit behind three dots at the top right hand corner of the screen and an extra tap. So as a pro tip, make sure to use the pinned comments to add your own calls to action. This box in the bottom right hand corner is the audio source for the YouTube short. If the add sound feature was used that we showed earlier, then it would be listed here. Otherwise it's original audio from the YouTube short that anyone can take and use on their video or use a remix tool and potentially use the audio and video as part of their own YouTube short. For traditional creators protective of their content, this might seem a little scary, but everybody who makes YouTube shorts agrees to these rules. Analytics do exist for YouTube shorts and they have their own dedicated section in the YouTube studio. It's a pretty comprehensive collection of data and you can view it both on desktop and on mobile. And now for the only question that really matters, can you make money from YouTube shorts? Yes, 
Yes, you can. If you only make shorts on YouTube, your requirements are 1,000 subscribers and 10 million YouTube shorts views over the last 90 days. You don't need to track watch hours at all. Having said that, if you do get 4,000 watch hours from long form content, you can monetize YouTube shorts as well. But here's the catch. CPMs are tiny for shorts compared to long form content. You will need tens of millions of views to earn hundreds of dollars. Do you feel like you're having trouble getting your YouTube shorts to go viral? Whether you love them or hate them, you've heard us say this before, you should be making YouTube shorts today if you're trying to grow on YouTube. And this isn't just us saying this, this is coming directly from YouTube themselves. Creators who are uploading both short and long form content are seeing better overall watch time and subscriber growth compared to those who are only uploading on one format. Well, hey, that sounds promising, but if you're just starting out, things could feel a bit daunting or confusing. You're trying to crack the code and get people to actually watch your shorts. And in fact, here at vidIQ, we're also trying to crack that very same code. And after studying hundreds of channels, we think we have some answers for you. Beating the YouTube Shorts algorithm is possible, but it is going to take a brand new skill set for those of you who are new to uploading short form content. So it's time to take everything you know about optimizing a long form video and put it aside. Because if you're trying to grow on YouTube Shorts, we're gonna talk about how this is gonna be a little bit different. With YouTube Shorts, you have maybe about three seconds or so to get them to stop scrolling and give the rest of your short a chance. And if they do give your short a chance and the viewer watches the rest of it, YouTube is much more likely to push that short to even more people. With that in mind, there is one thing you as a creator need to focus on whenever you make a short, and that is your hook. Your hook could be some text on the screen or something you do or say, or maybe even a sudden camera movement that somebody sees when they scroll to your short. So as we go through these today's, actually let us know in the comments, what are some hooks that you've seen on shorts that got you to stop scrolling? Everything you do in the hook of your short is all about raising curiosity. Now, normally you would use a title and a thumbnail to raise that curiosity, but with shorts, you don't really have that opportunity. You kind of got to think about it like acting out this title and thumbnail in a YouTube short in the first couple of seconds. You've probably seen some examples of this, one of them being, have you heard about? There's always the tried and true, they don't want you to know. Do you know about the black baby test? No? Well then, let me tell you. Have you ever heard of the region beta paradox? You might be suffering from it right now. And something that works on me all the time is you've never seen anything like this. These type of hooks can work really well for any type of YouTube topic that you want to cover and gain a new audience for. You're taking something that a person wouldn't otherwise care about and turning it into kind of an interesting factoid on YouTube short. This is a raw steak. And this is me putting that steak into the dishwasher. Okay, trust me, check this out. According to Mythbusters, dishwashers can get up to nearly 150 50 degrees. And everything you do on YouTube Shorts is going to need to apply to somebody who's brand new to your channel and perhaps brand new to your topic. Going forward, keep those viewers in mind as you record your shorts. Anyway, back to the subject of raising curiosity. You could get people to be curious about something that specifically happened to you, one of your own experiences. Something like, this is the most amazing product I've ever seen, or I would never do this and this is why. I never buy silk. And this is the strange reason why. As a kid- Just be careful not to give too much away in the first few seconds so people feel like they actually want to finish watching the short. This is the most powerful charger I've ever laid hands on. And there's still a ton more examples to go through here for raising curiosity. I was today years old. I was today years old when I found this out. It took me 19 years to figure out news stands for notable events, weather, and sports. Never knew that. Questions I get asked a lot. I asked Google. I asked Google what the longest jump in history is. Three things I can do. Here are three things I do before every flight coming from a lawyer who travels six months out of the year. I'm sure by now as a seasoned YouTuber or YouTube viewer or both, you know the importance of a call to action. We generally think of these for ourselves, right? When we're trying to get someone to leave a comment or subscribe or leave a like. But with shorts, a call to action can be the entire hook of a video. Something as simple as try this. Try this to get more views on your next YouTube short. Or you gotta try this. You gotta try this with your phone. Put your speaker on your mouth like this. Doing this gets people excited that they're gonna learn something new, maybe a new fact or a new skill, as long as they continue watching your channel. You could do this by opening with a different kind of question, such as, did you know that? Did you know that this book is poisonous? And this woman discovered it. Hi, Nas Daily. Or maybe crazy facts. Crazy body facts that you probably didn't know. Did you know that your brain generates enough electricity just by thinking? You can also get people really thinking about things they wouldn't have thought of before. You've probably seen videos that start with, have you ever wondered? Have you ever wondered what the most viewed YouTube video is? We got, uh, let just go, music, passenger. let her go. Or by asking the question, is it possible to... Is it possible to feel high with pressure points? Well, according to this doctor... Let's shift 
shift gears a little bit though. What if your channel is about reviewing products? Well, you could keep it really simple and just compare two products, X versus Y. Biggest smartphone versus smallest smartphone. Which one's actually more practical? Or you could mention why you'd never try a product. And that kind of negativity can get people to stop scrolling. Why I would never style my maxi skirt like this and how I would change it. If you want to push a service or talk about things like fashion and makeup, you can educate your viewers on the do's and don'ts that they should follow. Do's and don'ts of coat shapes. Don't pair a puffer coat with proper shoes like loafers or ballet flats. Or simply how to do things themselves. How to create festive outfits if you're a minimalist. Try pairing some sheer socks or tights underneath your jeans to make them feel more evening appropriate. Everybody wants to feel included. It's as if our brains are literally wired around FOMO. So include your viewers in your life and in your various experiments. For example, today we're gonna see. Today we're gonna see how much water this Scooby-Doo can hold. I'm trying this so you don't have to. I'm doing this so you don't have to. I've been hunting for the dumbest world record. Watch me. Watch me try to fix this squishy. It's in really bad shape. Today I'm going to. Today I'm gonna find out if a Bic lighter really does burn for 55 minutes. And we all know there's a trick that works for even long form videos and that is to make a list. These generally keep people watching all the way to the end. And you can do this in shorts too. For example, seven best. Seven tastiest smartphone cases. Starting off with the ice lolly. Five products you won't believe exist. Five Amazon products you won't believe are real. Number five is the sun visor fan hat. Top three. Top three YouTube mistakes. If you're trying to position yourself as an educator on a specific topic, then hacks is a great way to share something new with somebody. Everybody loves a quick hack and you can say that this hack is going to help you reach whatever goal that is in three easy steps. How do we become a mermaid in three steps? First, go to a friend's birthday party and push her away. Here's how to have the best blank of your life. Here's how to have the best sleep of your entire entire life. Make sure your room is dark. There's always simple how to. Here's how to write an entire book using ChatGPT. Step one, you say, hey, I want to write a book about this topic. Can you give me five, 10 title ideas? And then of course, just outright mentioning hacks themselves. This could get your YouTube shorts a lot more views. Another kind of cheeky thing you can do is create some sense of urgency as soon as people scroll to your short. You could straight up ask people to stop scrolling. Wait, stop scrolling. Straight on your back. Why are you always slouching? Do you see how tense your forehead is? Relax it. Relax it now. Or you could talk about how doing this right now is the most important thing of your life. This is the most important decision you can make on your YouTube channel, and a lot of people get it wrong. You've probably stumbled upon a bunch of shorts by now, that talk about making more money. Everyone wants to make a little bit of money on the side and having somebody spoon feed that information to you is pretty tempting as you're just kind of swiping through shorts. If you know a good way to make some money, you can give people a little bit of a monetary incentive to stop scrolling. You could talk about making X dollars a day using a specific product. There are four ways to make $800 a day using ChatGPT. The first method is to sell birthday cards with a poem on Etsy. Or going back to hacks, hacks that will save you money. Art hacks that'll save you money, part one. First up, we have these plastic food containers. All you do is add a couple of paper towels to it, spray it until it's damp, add your acrylic paint like you normally would, and this makes the paint not dry out. So there you have it, your ultimate guide to hooks that work. Every time you post a YouTube shot, it feels like it's going to go viral, doesn't it? Oh, cool, I'm a small channel and I've already got a thousand views. Then, bang, everything suddenly stops. And then it keeps happening over and over and over again. Which leaves you to start wondering, is the YouTube algorithm truly against me? Or worse still, have I been shadow banned? Now, usually I would try to convince you otherwise, but what if this time you're right? So you have these seed audiences, the seed audience will try and be like, oh, it's not really that much interest and then you'll see it drop suddenly. And in this video, that's what we aim to find out. Why YouTube Shorts views always seem to start strong and then suddenly tank. You'll learn what's going on behind the scenes with the YouTube algorithm and how it decides which videos to promote. Now it turns out timing and consistency are crucial factors. So you're going to want to pay close attention because I'm going to reveal the optimum posting strategies to ensure that those views don't taper off. But if you get the timing wrong, yep, that temperamental Shorts algorithm is gonna do its thing. So make sure you stick around until the end of this video because I'm going to show you all of the actionable tips that reveal how the YouTube Shorts algorithm is working in 2023. Oh, and I also forgot, there's a little game of spot the difference in this video. So if you find it, let us know in the comments below. and I'll give you a thumbs up. And is there such a thing as YouTube shadow banning you from Shorts? Well, uh, keep watching. But first, let's throw this over to you. Have your Shorts views ever dropped off inexplicably. If the answer is yes, which I'm sure it is for many of you, then try the timing strategies in this video and then come back and let us know how you got on. Now then, you're probably quite familiar with this typical YouTube shorts graph. Not much happens for a few hours and then whoosh, 
it suddenly takes off, only to flatten out just as quickly. Now, when I first saw this in action years ago, I phrased it as the short surge, without really understanding the why behind what was going on. But now, we have an expert's explanation to back all of this up. And if you've got some spare time, try saying shorts surge, an expert's explanation really fast 10 times. Now I will confess that this expert opinion comes from someone on Reddit, claiming to be a former data scientist from one of the fabled FANG companies. But allow me to explain. The YouTube shorts algorithm consists of two stages explore and exploit. And it's the seed audience from these stages that determines whether a short takes off. If you're a smaller channel, we wanna get you uh, a seed audience. Like if we don't know, know a ton about you, like let's say you're just starting out, we wanna get that as fast as possible. If you're a really small channel, it may make, take a little bit of time for you to get that seed audience and ramp it. Now these two dudes are not random experts on Reddit. They're actual YouTube employees, so they should know a little bit about how the YouTube Shorts algorithm works. So we'll get back to the seed audience in a second. The Reddit post explains the explore and exploit stages as a multi-armed bandit system. So think slot machines at a casino. When you first publish a shot, it enters an explore phase where it gets sent out to a small random seed audience. This seed audience acts like a focus group to test if your content resonates. The algorithm tries to find viewers that might be a good match for your shot based on factors like your niche, their watch history and so on. But here's the catch, that seed audience may not represent your target audience. The seed audience, especially if you're a smaller channel, is randomly selected by the algorithm to minimize regret and maximize engagement. And to support this theory, remember what the YouTube employee said. If you're a really small channel, it may make, take a little bit of time for you to get that seed audience and ramp it. So if we go back to the one-armed bandit, if YouTube finds a perfect seed audience, you've hit the jackpot. And when that happens, the algorithm moves on to its next phase exploit. The short will get more exposure and be sent out more widely. However, if that initial seed audience isn't engaged, it doesn't provide enough momentum for the short to really take off. And then the algorithm will, well, I'll just let the YouTube employee explain. The seed audience will try and be like, oh, it's not really that much interest and then you'll see it drop suddenly. But what if your counter to all of this is the fact that the video got thousands of views? Surely that's good data for YouTube to work with, right? Well, yes, for long form content, but not necessarily for shorts. I think also for creators, we're used to impressions, click-through rates, and that doesn't exist in a feed. And so those views feel to me like more like impression than traditional views. That's right. And I think that especially creators starting out, I think a lot of those early views, they're sort of very like exploratory. Yeah. Typically, when you watch shorts, you don't choose the ones you end up watching. YouTube chooses for you through the shorts feed. And so logically, the only way to really test these shorts isn't through impressions, it's through views. Going forward, that is something to remember. Impressions test long form content, views test shorts, especially when they're first released. You need to keep this strategy top of mind make great YouTube shorts for your target audience. And this is how you stack the odds in your favor. Research your target audience and find out what makes them tick and tailor everything you do from text, visuals, editing to match what they like. This gives you a better chance of the content resonating with whatever seed audience YouTube sends your way. Try to post one or two shorts a day to increase your chance of hitting that jackpot. You can find out through YouTube when your audience is online. So through that, you can match your publishing times to when your users are most active on YouTube. The data that will be most useful to you is the new swipe away analytic. And YouTube also now includes returning viewers for shorts content. In other words, do you hook viewers before they have the chance to swipe away? Once we here at vidIQ began adopting these strategies, YouTube eventually discovered the perfect seed audience for our shorts. And now they function very much like regular videos in terms of views, including views from search and external traffic sources. But we'll also admit that none of this came easy to us. It took about a year and a hundred YouTube shorts to figure this out. So yeah. Patience is always a YouTube virtue. And with this YouTube short, we can really put that Reddit theory to the test. 1.2 million views in 70 days. And what did it do? Explore and exploit. Exploit and exploit some more. So with the YouTube shorts algorithm still effectively being a work in progress, does that mean it's exploitable, vulnerable to hacks? Well, apparently there is one. Many claim to have exploited it and it's as simple as they come. 
re-upload it. If your YouTube short is stuck at one view, here's a little trick you can try. Alright, so what I'm gonna do is re-upload the clip onto YouTube. The video with one view, I'm actually just going to make it unlisted for now. Alright, I'm making the new video public, so let's see what happens. So it's a day later and we're at 176 views as opposed to being stuck at one. Okay, so would we recommend doing that? No! Probably not. This same YouTube employee who was speaking to Colin Samia is part of our vidIQ Max Discord group. And he says that to YouTube, re-uploading will be seen as abusive and will get your channel flagged as spam. And that's when you could truly consider your channel shadow banned. And for good reason. A while back, YouTube announced that it was gonna start sharing ad revenue made from YouTube Shorts with creators. All you need is a thousand subscribers and 10 million Shorts views over the last 90 days. Many of you have expressed that you feel this requirement is completely absurd, but uh, I mean, is it? Is 10 million Shorts views in 90 days really unreachable? Listen, listen, listen. I don't care what you think about the 10 million views in the 90 days. Today I'm here to give you some ideas that actually work for YouTube Shorts and will they get you to 10 million views? I don't know, but I do think they'll get you a lot more than what you're getting now. The first tip I have for you, and this is becoming even more important day after day, is doing tutorials in YouTube Shorts. A year ago, I would not have recommended this at all, but today, YouTube Shorts are showing up in search. So teach people to do something that you're good at in a short, concise way. For example, here's a quick skin retouch tutorial that got over 5 million views. The next tip I have for you is to recycle long form content. So if you're a creator who's already making long form videos, what you need to be doing is thinking about ways you can repurpose parts of those videos into their own independent YouTube Shorts. And this strategy also works for folks who aren't video creators, but are crafting lengthy blog posts that are full of valuable information. Marina and Gary V are nailing this format and getting millions of views. There's also jumping on YouTube short hacks. For example, you could take a really viral life hack video and then do a reaction to it or try out the life hack for yourself. Before you do, of course, you should make sure that it fits into your actual niche. How can you make it so that your regular audience would also be interested? You could take some inspiration here from watching the shorts that a channel called Lionfield is making. One thing to try would be before and after videos. These videos are great when you're trying to show your audience exactly how to achieve a specific goal. Just be sure that the results of the after are easily identifiable so your audience feels like they know exactly what you're talking about. You can find a ton of great examples of this on the DIY home decor channel. Another format you see all the time on shorts are quick tips videos. The idea here is to break down complex topics into small, easy to memorize portions. It also helps with these types of videos to add captions so your audience can more easily follow along and these captions will help them memorize what they're learning. This video that includes beginner's tips for Warzone players got 2 million views. And this one that provides tips on how to answer the hardest job interview questions got 30 million views. Scrolling through YouTube shorts, you might have also notice videos that point out myths or common misconceptions. So this one's really about how observant you are. Have you noticed any myths or common misconceptions in your space? If you have, take the opportunity to set the record straight and dismantle those completely in your own video. This channel, for example, is sharing movie mistakes and they are getting millions of views for it. Motivational videos are also something that have performed very well on YouTube, regardless of shorts. It won't be for everybody, but depending on what you're doing on YouTube, it might make sense for you to make a motivational piece about it. These tips will obviously differ industry to industry, but for example, if you're into fitness, this might include a motivational video about working out and eating right. The easiest form of this is to just share something that happened to you and use that to inspire or motivate somebody else. In her most popular short, Growing Bananas did this and got 38 million views. Also, I really hope I said their name right. Thinking of topics that connect to your industry or niche on YouTube, you can make a fun facts video. You can compile all of these different things into one list and make that into a short. For example, this channel is making facts videos that generate millions of views. If you are a tech channel or a channel that deals with just getting a lot of different products all the time, you might want to make unboxing videos as YouTube Shorts. You could do a lot of creative things with your edits and make these unboxings really enticing. Do this enough and you may become a product influencer and strike up brand deals with different companies so that you can unbox their products in your next video. I know a couple of creators who literally make a million dollars per sponsored short. I have like probably one of the best strategies that I haven't seen anyone do. I think that a shorts creator can make just as much money as a long form creator. Today we are diving into the world of YouTube shorts with one of the fastest rising stars on the platform, Jenny Hoyos. Jenny is by far one of the top creators making shorts on YouTube, averaging about 10 million views per short. In this step-by-step -step breakdown, Jenny will be sharing her best strategies around ideation, hooks, storytelling, analytics, monetization, and more. And by the end of my talk with Jenny, you should be left with a crystal clear blueprint for creating high performing shorts. First things first, 
what do you feel like your overarching strategy is and the mindset that like enables this level of consistency is? I think the biggest overarching thing is treating YouTube like a business. So I'm just like making sure that I'm very like on top of my schedule. Like all my content is scheduled. All my content is on a calendar. I make sure that no matter what, there is a YouTube video posted on Saturday at 10 a.m. EST. So I think for me, it's making sure that I do quality quantity. So I want my videos to be quality, but I also want to make sure that I'm uploading consistently. Even at the age of 18, Jenny has made the decision to treat her YouTube channel like a business. She's investing so much time and effort to not only grow the business, but also make it profitable. In order to be profitable as a business, you need to go out and find yourself a potential customer, or in Jenny's case, a target audience. One of the things you mentioned recently was that as creators, we want to be in a blue ocean as opposed to like a red ocean. How do you deliberately like position yourself in a space with little competition, which is basically what the analogy is, sorry to spoil it. When I think of blue ocean, I think of having your own unique twist. So granted, we're all gonna have idols or steal like an artist, but at the end of the day, you should still have your own unique thing that makes you unique. But what's your unique advantage? What are things that you're skilled at? Things in your situation that <laughs> help benefit you, basically, is the way I like to see a blue ocean. I was always like into entrepreneurship and business, so I knew I wanted to make videos about finance or money. And at first, I was actually actually copying Graham Stephan like one for one I kid you not the exact same style like the exact same like everything basically I have unlisted those videos because it's very cringe like that's just like a red ocean because everyone's trying to be Graham Stephan but then I looked at like everyone else in the money finance industry and I noticed that like there's no one doing it for kids so I knew that there was a gap in the market essentially and I had to do it well I would say she bridged the gap just fine coming from a family of extreme money savers she picked up tips and relatable humor from them. In other words, she took an experience that was unique to her life and used it to make content that other people could relate to. But what's equally significant here is that her being a younger creator made it so that she could relate to other young people who wouldn't normally think about saving money. And if you want to attract an audience of people who wouldn't normally think about saving money, you need to make sure that your hook is spot on on to get them to stop scrolling immediately. So let's talk about hooks for a little bit. Walk me through like the process for you for coming up with like an incredibly catchy and effective hook. So a good hook is concise, no more than three seconds. It needs to be very visually pleasing, very visually appealing. It needs to be so good that you can be watching the video on mute and still understand what the video is about. So I try to make sure that the composition's good. What I mean by that is like everything centered in frame. I try to make sure there's no more than three objects in the frame. It's, it needs to be so good that you can use it as a thumbnail on one of your long form videos. I think the most underrated thing in hooks is foreshadowing. So a good hook not only stops your scroll, but also makes sure so you get to the end of the video. You should foreshadow what is to expect at the end. Some things that are very easy to apply is like, here are three reasons why X. So now we know the video is going to end on three. So it doesn't need to be too complicated. Or my favorite example is I started a video by giving my grandma a $5 Christmas present and showing her reaction. So I started with the cold open of her reacting to this $5 gift. But the thing is, you don't see what the gift is until the end of the video. I hope you can appreciate that the tips Jenny is giving us here are pure gold. Grabbing an audience's attention to get them to stop scrolling is everything when it comes to YouTube shorts. It's important to note, though, that's not the only thing because you also need a good average view duration. You need people to watch the whole thing. And in order to do that, you need to tell stories. Now, I know some people kind of feel like they have a natural ability to just tell stories, but if you're anything like me, it's something that is a bit intimidating. Fortunately, though, for you and me, this is something you can learn. This is a skill you can develop. So what storytelling frameworks and like techniques are you using? I'm going to start with the simplest ending with the hardest retention tactic. So the simplest one that anyone can apply is but so storytelling. So it's basically setting up conflict and then resolving the conflict and then setting up new conflict. So imagine a story where you say, oh, I wanted to go on a walk. So I went outside, it started raining and I didn't know what to do. Uh, so I went back home. It's, it's like, okay, it's a story, I guess. But when you use but and so, it just sounds more entertaining. Like I was at home, but I got bored. So I ended up going for a walk, but it started raining. So I ended up trying to figure out what to do. I was looking for an umbrella, but I couldn't find one. So I had to go back home. So it's like the story just seems so much more engaging when you use those words. I probably like repeat myself so many times on these shorts but every time I say but like it stops someone from scrolling it's like but what so that's one method and the second thing I love to do 
is dual narrative storytelling. So with shorts, you want to keep your videos very concise. And it's very hard to do that because you probably want to get across multiple different messages, but you only have like 60 seconds to do that. So what I do is this technique where I tell two stories at the same time. I tell one story through my voiceover or whatever I'm saying, and the second story is told in what I'm showing. So an example of me doing this is I wanted to give my grandma a $5 Valentine's gift present. But the reason why I was doing that is because, you know, it was the first year she didn't have a Valentine because my grandpa passed away. And I'm like, that's way too much context. And it's also almost like too sad. I feel like people are like, it's going to scroll if I say that. So instead I talked, my voiceover was me talking about me making the present for her, but I never said the additional context. Instead, I showed pictures of her with my grandpa to almost show to the viewer that this is the reason why I'm doing it without telling them that. Jenny has admittedly studied these big creators for thousands of hours to come up with these strategies. So you can rest assured these are tried and tested by the best out there. Ryan Trahan is a prime example of using visuals to add context. But you may have noticed that Jenny and Ryan's shorts are packed with info, but very carefully. You never want to overwhelm an audience in your YouTube shorts. It's all about finding a rhythm and a pacing. What are like some of your best practices around structure and pacing? My favorite pacing when it comes to like Structuring pacing, since it's very similar, is quick hook, medium paced middle, and probably like a peak in somewhere in the middle, like a funny joke, back to medium pacing, and then quick ending. You want to make sure that it's almost a roller coaster of emotions. <laughs> There's multiple theories that back this up. So one that I want to get into is peak end theory. And it's this theory that people only remember their favorite part of a movie or whatever they're watching and the ending. Like you never think of like, oh, I remember when this boring thing happened, which makes sense. But that's like the whole point of it. I think because creators are forced in shorts to keep their videos under 60 seconds long and keep their energy up, a lot of their ideas kind of get rushed through. Oftentimes the videos can lose their flow and confuse the audience. Do not talk fast. Just talk more concise and try to get the message across in the least amount of words possible. Usually you'll give like that concise, quick action packed value and context and then right after like giving so much context, you need to let it breathe so that they can understand the context that they just heard. Once you finish making a video that you're very, very excited to share, it's difficult not to just go ahead and hit publish. But before you do, a good practice here is to take a step back and ask yourself a few questions. Imagine for a second that you're the viewer of this video. Does it make sense? Is it captivating? Does it capture the right emotion? Because you should absolutely be making it a priority to understand how the audience is going to feel when they watch your short. I don't care if it's shorts or longs, Connecting with your audience is everything. How do you get insight into your audience's like mindset and preferences? I feel like the best way to do it is literally to send your videos to your avatar if possible. So like for me, it's very simple to just send it to a younger family member or like also my parents. But if you don't have that, utilizing your analytics is very important. I try to look at the retention graph, not the percentage. But you look at the retention graph and you see like, oh, this joke just did not hit or I talked way too long for that. And you just kind of have to like come up with your own assumptions and like figure that out and apply it to new videos. But as for what content to make and content strategy, I'm looking for videos that are a bit old, but performing in the last 48 hours. Because like, for example, right now, my last 48 hours is one video from a year ago. And then a bunch of them are videos from like last month. But then what's interesting is like, why is my number one performer a video from last year? And that's how you understand like what videos are actually the ones you need to recreate and what is actually resonating with your audience. For example, I'll look at, oh, what's my average duration of videos that are my top performers. That's how I know my best videos are 34 seconds. So I'll usually just like toggle as many analytics as possible and see if there's any patterns there. Yes, understanding your analytics is great for helping to increase your views and watch time and find trends within your content. But the real win lies in making content that people love. When you watch something that you love from a creator, you go back and you wanna watch more of it. That's how you build a community and grow on YouTube. What else do you intentionally do to build loyalty and get views? viewers like coming back habitually. Buckets is probably like 90% of like creating returning viewers. So buckets are repeatable formats and I try to keep mine very similar titled. So for example, my bucket would be $1 fast food item versus restaurant. So it would be like $1 burrito, $1 boba, $1 everything basically. And because everything is titled and structured and formatted and the video is very similar, like all the videos are metadata linked. YouTube can easily be like, oh, the viewer liked when she made $1 pizza. Oh, they're gonna like when she makes a $1 sandwich or a $1 burger. It's very easy for YouTube to understand what your viewer is gonna wanna watch next. So the goal with returning viewers on shorts is to make videos that your viewer 
viewer is probably going to watch next. And you do that through structure, format, and metadata, such as title. If you're uploading once a week, I think two to four buckets is really reasonable. Even though making shorts is awesome and all this advice is really helpful, there is one glaring issue when it comes to shorts, and that is your return on investment. Honestly, are shorts even worth it? I'm sure you've seen like the AdSense mm -hmm. on shorts for most creators is very small. But you yourself are someone who's admitted to everybody. I love money. How can somebody who's like getting into shorts and seeing a bit of success like leverage them to make money? Shorts is totally a viable way to make money. I don't know who like thought that it's not. I think that a shorts creator could make just as much money as a long form creator. Maybe not as much ad revenue, but you can make the same money. I average like 50 to 100 million views per month on shorts. So because of that, it ranges between 5 to 10k per month in ad revenue versus like if I was doing long form and I was getting those views, what the heck? I'd be like at what, like 100K a month? Like, so theoretically, ad revenue wise, it's it's much worse. But if you have products, courses, sponsorships, that's where the money is to be made. I know a couple of creators who literally make a million dollars per sponsored short. I'm just saying so. And they get less views than me or probably about the same. You just got to be a good businessman, good businesswoman, good business person. I can say firsthand, we've witnessed a huge surge in channels that are exclusively making YouTube shorts. But a lot of the creators we've spoken to have a business minded plan of eventually branching out into longer form content. Expanding your reach with long form videos is easier said than done, but not impossible. What would you tell someone who's enjoying a lot of success on their shorts, but they're struggling with long form? When I say that, I, I think of you as somebody who can get 10 million views in a short in your sleep and then you know you post a long form and you're not enjoying those same views on average what would you say to someone who's kind of feeling the same way it really sucks i think you have to see it as like two different games like they're two completely different challenges to me with long form every second doesn't matter as much as it does in shorts because one second on a short is over one percent retention but on a long form one second isn't even one percent retention so if you lose right. one second percentage wise it's not huge but with shorts it's like everything is so exponential my strategy to convert from shorts to long form is to literally make very similar feeling content. What I mean by that is bit-based videos, essentially creating 30 second shorts until it adds up to an eight minute video. For example, I easily have like 20 shorts where I recreated fast food items. So imagine a long form where I did like, I recreated 100 fast food items. And it's basically the same thing because I know my shorts viewers watch that. I mean, and that sounds like a fantastic way to keep like a shorts viewer, like potentially hooked on a long form video. But as, as I'm sure you're well aware of, a lot of people struggle with this. Getting people to watch. If I created my own YouTube channel, all eyes would be on me and I would make every puny human YouTuber disappear off this platform. Getting people to watch your long form videos, who watch your shorts, is almost impossible. How are you handling that challenge? And what are you, what are you seeing in your data? So for context, my shorts average 10 million views per video, but my long forms range between 50 to 500K. It's a very wide range. But like my top performing videos on long form are like literally almost all returning viewers. So what I am identifying is, yes, people are converting from shorts to long form and the return is actually great. In fact, even when I link a long form from my short, like with the related, the new related feature, like my retention is like crazy high on my long forms, even though they're coming from shorts. And I think the reason is because the feel is just like very similar. I am Dylan Jarden. I would say worse of the two creators, but still a creator. Dylan's also being humble. Like he is the kind of guy who will go and live under a rock and figure out the viral formula. And he is the reason our content popped off. Meet Dylan and Henry, two creators who went from sleeping on the floor of their apartment. We were trying to make a podcast. Nobody was listening to it to making viral shorts through the power of storytelling. My first short that was story driven did 30 million views. Their videos even got the attention of icons such as Will Smith and Tim Ferriss. Will Smith and his team, they had seen our Naval video and Naval had seen our Tim Ferriss video and Tim Ferriss had seen our My First Million podcast video. All thanks to their refreshing perspective on being a creator. We don't make movies to make money, we make money to make movies. And all of that led to? In the first year of making content, went from zero subscribers to two million subscribers and one billion views. How did you do it? Dylan went monk mode and he was like, Henry, I'm just gonna go figure it out. And what he came back with four weeks later was, he's like, dude, like, I think if we're gonna crack something, we should A, take advantage of short form because that's where all the discoverability is. And then B, like, let's take a lesson from Mr. Beast, which is all about retention, retention, retention. And 
if we're going to get really good at retention, like what's the best way I know to do that? Well, it's to tell stories. It's in your 60 second short, just tell a story. Before he came up with that insight, I was doing these like abstract, like YouTube shorts about book quotes, thinking people cared about me. They don't. Like the day Dylan had me switch over to these story driven shorts, immediately things took off. My first short that was story driven did 30 million views. So that was Dylan's big insight. It was literally like this short, had 3,000 and then the short after learning, hey, how about you just tell a story, 30 million. So it was like just night and day, the difference. I had a script, I was in Dylan's apartment, I was just cranking on a script. I was like, dude, you gotta read this thing, like I'm stoked on it. It was my first clip about McDonald's. He comes over my shoulder, he takes a look and he's like, dude, what is this? This is garbage. Erase everything. Imagine we're sitting in a bar, we're drinking a beer and just explain the story to me like we're two friends. Tweaked the whole thing and it, it just went crazy. In addition to stories, your shorts have a very cool format. How did you find it? So how I had that original breakthrough, it wasn't anything novel that I came up with. I just actually, I think Henry originally found this channel. He's like, dude, check out this thing on TikTok called Big Weird World. And it was like these one or two kids that were pretty much like our age. And all they did was just pull up a green screen behind them. And then they had animations, like kind of funny animations in the background telling history stories. I'm like, Dan, that's a really sick format. I don't see that on YouTube and we live on YouTube. So it's like, can we just take that same format and just absolutely blow this up? And the nice thing is it, it worked because it was already proven on TikTok. And how do you find viral worthy content? How do you know what to invest your time in, in terms of scripting, shooting and editing? Similar to finding that format and remixing it for YouTube, we were like, let's just take already long form content, 10 minute, 20 minute, 30 minute videos that have millions of views. That's a blueprint for virality. They've already done it. So can we just tweak and remix and retell that story in 60 seconds? Don't reinvent the wheel. The other thing I think is like Dylan and I will just be scrolling through Twitter and you either see a blog post with a lot of likes or you see a little psychological hack or you see a little history story. And my thought is always, wow, if that hooked me, if I'm here like reading this longer thing now, well, there's gotta be like a thousand other people like me, 10,000 other people. That's kind of our general approach. But then it's like, figure out exactly what hooked you. Maybe it's a video of an armadillo just crossing the road. And it's like, wow, that video is really interesting because like I didn't expect the armadillo to like roll that way. Just figure out like what hooked you and that's what you're gonna use as your hook. So I would just take that now armadillo video and just like put that at the very start of your video and be like, look how crazy it is this armadillo is rolling across the road. Do you have a system for finding a lot of good ideas? Yeah, so in terms of finding a lot of content ideas, I think it's just making that switch in your mind, which is like, I'm looking for ideas now. You don't just like sit on the couch and try and write down ideas. You just go about your day. And in conversation, someone says, well, why does this work the way it does? I don't know, let me Google it. Oh, okay, there's an idea. Or when you've got that switch turned, you start watching YouTube videos. It's like, what, what interests me? Did that thing go viral? Yes, it did. Okay, can I retell it? So I think you make the switch. You just say like, I'm going into idea mode, create a note in your phone, label it like my ideas, and then just go about your life. And as you see them pop up serendipitously out of life, write them down. It's near impossible to sit down and try and just come up with them. And then just refer back to your list and you've probably got a thousand things that would work. I don't know, our, our issue has never been searching for ideas day of. It's like filtering this list of 100 ideas. Which one do we want to shoot today? So how do you filter down the list? Right, with all these videos, we know they have viral potential. They already got our attention. So now it's just like, okay, which one do I want to tell today? It's pretty easy. It's like, oh, today I want to talk about how sweet green makes money because I just ate a sweet green. As artists, you need deadlines. If you have that massive list, you need to say, hey, I got to get something out in 60 minutes because without even artificial deadlines, like you'll just be scrolling through the list forever. Make a deadline, write the thing, get it done. Where does niche fit into all of this? We never focus on a niche. Like we tell uh, a short about like the difference between zebras and horses. And then the next short would be like, how does Costco make money like very little overlap there was just like enough traction like we didn't care if one was a million views and one was a hundred thousand it's like roughly people are finding this interesting and after that i checked out of looking at stats altogether overall once a month maybe i'll check in and be like okay the views are at like 40 million this month or 20 million this month i don't change really much beyond that i just go whatever's interesting to me i'm sure like henry said there are a thousand people that also find this interesting we were trying to focus on the inputs as opposed to the outputs it's like let me just craft the best story i can let me just layer on the absolute best edit I can. And then I'm going to post the thing and ghost. That was what interested you at the time. So I think Dylan's really good at like just chasing like what feels like play as opposed to like grinding on what, what feels like work. And for us, that was just like not having a niche going, doing these broad appeal clips and, and just kind of chasing what we were interested in. We see a lot of
of creators make the mistake of focusing on the extrinsic stuff like views and subscribers. What else do you think trips up most new creators? The problem with content creation in general is everyone's trying to just be a better version of what they're already seeing. And that just never works because you're going to be like 10% better, but that's not enough to really crack through. You have to be 10 times better, not 10%. It's like, okay, how do you be 10 times better? Well, it's going to look like nothing you've seen before on YouTube. Particularly, we hadn't seen people spend three days to a week animating a short for 60 seconds and just telling it like Vox quality. So I think that's really like if we were to start over right now, it would be looking like, hey, what is that thing that no one's doing? I think that's hard. If you're just sitting on your butt and you don't know what to create, like I think that's hard. I think the straightforward way to become the best or be the only is to just take five different formats you like and five different topics you like and smash them together. For us, it was Big Weird World and Casey Neistat and Van Neistat and like Drunk History, Vox. And then when we smash these six formats together, guess what? We're the only people doing Johnny Harris, Vox, Casey Neistat, Big Weird World, South Park, you know, like all in one. So I think finding formats that already work or even like old formats that worked in the past and then remixing them is, is a great place to start. Aside from a unique format, are there other ways new creators can stand out? What's nice about our style with the green screen pull up, it's like we almost have that now patented on YouTube. Like it's just like our thing. And the nice thing is it is in the first three seconds. We're going to have something recognizable where you see this green screen and it's us on screen pulling it up. It's like, okay, that's a good video. I've seen a million videos like this before. They clearly work. So that's where I'd really invest my innovation energy. It's like, okay, how do I like figure out how to really stand out at the start? There's some way where you can just get people to stop the scroll in the first three seconds and make that just your trademark style. Do you think beginner creators should start with shorts instead of long form? I love shorts compared to long form because shorts is like, you just make a video. Like long form, you got to figure out like, is the title good? Is the thumbnail good? Oh, I just spent two weeks on this and it's got to work versus a short is like, hey, I'm going to put out a short today and then a short in two days. And it's like, I'm just pumping out content. So like, if this doesn't work, that's totally fine. I'm just going to keep doing what I like. So there's just a lot less pressure, especially when you're starting out. And these short form platforms are like the ultimate rewarder of just good video or good story. Thumbnail doesn't matter. Hashtags don't matter. Titles doesn't matter. Description doesn't matter. None of that matters. It's just like, may the best story, may the best retention video win. What would you say to creators who think shorts and YouTube in general are super competitive? So everything, yes, it's super competitive because everyone's just copying each other. But if you decide just not to copy other people, it's just pure blue ocean. Finding the blue ocean, that's a term we hear a lot these days. How did you learn not to copy and make quality content? We have a couple of philosophies, but one of them is perfection through iteration, not revision. So we're trying, especially with short form, it's just like, hey, awesome. I think we could tweak this going forward, but let's just publish this because we, we get really excited about hitting publish. And now the next version, we're going to apply this new concept that maybe we, we missed in the last one. We're okay publishing content that's good enough, it's still very high quality, but it's good enough just to like keep that inspiration, the, the passion moving forward. And Henry and I, we look back at our videos from a year ago and like we can't physically watch them. Like we're, we're squirming in our seats. At the time, we thought it was awesome. And it's like, if we just accept, hey, as long as this video is just a little bit better than the last one, it doesn't have to be perfect, but we're moving in the right direction. Now, when you look back a year later, it's like, this looks like Pixar. How the hell did we get there? Oh, well, it's through perfection through iteration. What would you say to creators who are perfectionists? He, we came across this video and, and quote from Jack Conti, the founder of Patreon, where he said, take things to and publish them at 80% because going from 80% to 100 scrubs all the fun out of the process. And we saw that he published that video like right when we were getting our start. We released things at 80% because nothing fun happens at 80 to 100%. You mentioned you had a couple of philosophies. What's the other one? This was another framework we were lucky enough to find at the time. I forget who it came from, but it was just relish in the obscurity. Nobody cares about you right now. Nobody's watching your stuff, which is beautiful because you can just create and create and create and learn and tinker and tweak things and get 1% better each time while nobody's watching. Relish in that obscurity. Do you have an example of where you tried to get 1% better each time, but still didn't get views? I shot like 200 daily vlogs and nobody was watching them. But what I realized is if you just do that, if you go through the motions, like day one short is gonna be very different from day 200. If you're just like, can I make this 0.5%? 1% better with each iteration, even if nobody's watching it, then you're gonna be a lot better off uh, 200 days down the line. Making 200 daily blogs could have easily led to burnout. What's your take on that? I think 
it's easy to, to burn out on content, especially content you just don't love doing. We've always tried to avoid this pigeonhole of like, you find one video that works and then you're just like, I'm gonna keep doing that thing. And you find yourself like in a couple months doing a video, and I know a ton of creators like this, videos that you don't actually care about. You just did it because the algorithm rewarded that. We've always tried to only teach things and tell stories that we, we really like so that we could do it for a long time. When the thing you're exploring, the topic you're exploring, the idea you're exploring, when it just feels like play, when it feels like it's that thing that you could do for 18 hours a day and like you don't stop to look at your clock once, then like burnout's never even a question. That's a really healthy way of looking at things. Any final words? I just think like there are two big concepts with how we create. Create for yourself and then be the best at that. So basically be your own favorite creator. I think that's just what we've done. It just makes the creation process so much more fun when you're creating for yourself versus like chasing some algorithm or getting locked into some niche because somebody told you to. I just create videos you want to make and see in the world and you'll be your number one fan. YouTube shorts are a terrible idea and they're going to ruin your channel. <laughs> YouTube shorts are the future of entertainment. What are you talking about? Dan, you're an idiot. You have no idea what you're talking about. And let's be honest, those lights behind you are more popular than yourself. Well, Rob, you are never going to be a superhero, no matter how many Amazon helmets and shields that you buy. Hold on, hold on, hold on, guys. Hold on. I, I think I have something. I found something that is going to settle this. Nate. Yeah, Nate. Howdy, Hi. howdy, everyone. We have yet another YouTube update in the studio. You go to analytics and then content. What you'll find a little bit down this screen is a panel called Viewers Across Format. It's, and it shows you the percentage of views you're getting from the different types of content that you can put out on YouTube, videos, live streams, and shorts. And this is creating some interesting discussions about videos versus shorts versus live streams. Is this analytic useful? I was actually really happy when I saw them uh, doing this. YouTube was building a bridge between shorts and long form. And this analytic was one of the first, uh, like best concrete evidences that I've seen of that. I think this is exactly what people like needed to see from YouTube because we get the questions a lot. Like are shorts even worth my time? You know, are people gonna watch the long form content? I always feel kind of validated when stuff like this happens because we've been saying like, some people might come to your long form content, but a shorts viewer is a shorts viewer. They're kind of in that shorts mindset when they're watching. It's difficult to pull them in. And this is like proof of that. You know, our analytics anyway are showing that 18% of people watch both things. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'd be fascinated for anybody watching this to share your um, analytics below, especially watching both if we're talking about shorts and long form content. And uh, Nate, I know you've been doing um, some research. Are you finding that creators have success with both longs and shorts or it tends to be one or the other? More recently, I was looking into shorts led channels, right. meaning, yep. you know, they, they've led with YouTube shorts or they're only YouTube shorts. I see this as a pretty clear indicator that YouTube is hoping that different content types can coexist well on the same channel. I'm seeing mixed results from my audience so far, different people saying, oh yeah, yeah, it works just fine to, to put them both on the same channel. And other people saying, no, it destroyed my long form views. Uh, it's been a bit of a mixed bag so far, but with that said, I feel like the fact that they did bring this out points to a clear direction that YouTube is hoping to go, Yeah, uh, which actually I see as a really positive thing. It, what's interesting when you say like, oh, it destroyed my channel, I have, my own uh channels that i experiment on and stuff and, and one of them is like primarily shorts i would say but i've done plenty of long form content and those long form videos do okay and when this analytic came out what was really frustrating was that 98 percent of my viewership or 97 percent watched shorts and like you know one to two percent watched like long form videos and of course almost none of them in that case watched both and i realized oh i had changed my shorts. I had started doing something that was getting more views, but it just inherently did not cater to the same audience at all. Just because I think these two things are similar and I like these two things doesn't mean the viewers do. It actually prompted me to remove the offending shorts, put them somewhere else, and things are already starting to correct a little bit more because again, now the channel as a whole, shorts, longs, live streams, all feels like it's for the same person again. Creators always ask uh, when there's a new analytic, what's a good number? Is there a good number for this analytic? Is it risk and reward? Like if I'm going to make more shorts, then I expect more views from coming from shorts and vice versa. My response to that would be, well, what's the goal? 
Like, what's the goal for your channel? I really think it's going to matter on what type of audience you're trying to attract. If you're trying to go for the, the, the type of audience that naturally likes short form content, then probably naturally you're going to have a higher ratio of that. But then of course, if you want to make more money from AdSense, then you'd want them watching both to be the biggest. It's your goals, right? But it's also your style. Like what kind of content do you enjoy making too? I can imagine like a documentary channel, like people who make hour long deep dive videos, probably not taking to shorts super well. But then again, like if their style permits it, they can go, I, I really like doing these deep dives, but what if I could tell the story in under a minute? and almost as a way to promote the things that I do. Like you could go either way with that. It just really depends, I think, on the type of creator you are. Do you think with this analytic, there may be a sense of more FOMO around shorts? Should creators just make shorts because they're there and there's the opportunity? Or are you potentially spreading your time, energy, resources across too many um, too many formats if you like an individual creator. I look at shorts as almost an entirely different language, so to speak. It seems to have a very different set of skills to be successful with it and a very different, naturally a very different audience. I think the primary thing is can channels grow really quickly with it? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. We have proof of that all the time, right? But once again, if it's not a language you want to learn, then Personally, I would say, mm, don't worry about it right now. Also, we, we should mention that it's not just about videos and shorts. If you do live streams, then you can check what the crossover is here. And it looks like the uh, differences numbers is a lot more extreme. Like maybe it's even more difficult to get people from videos or shorts to your live streams. And I just wanted to ask YouTube if you could just improve this analytic a little bit more because it says, yes, all right. 18% are watching both right now, but is that better than 28 days ago or worse? I think that would be exponentially more useful. YouTube, if you're watching this, that's a good idea. It's not just YouTube who are bringing more information to us about shorts. Nate, uh, you have done just done an enormous study on shorts. I think 35 billion views. You've uh, digested all of that and there were two significant takeaways from that, right? So first huge takeaway from that was the lengths of videos that are being most successful on YouTube Shorts. Both 13 seconds and 60 seconds were the two most cumulative views across these 35 billion views that I pulled. But the other high level takeaway I got from that was across the board of all of the channels that I reviewed that I would consider as being successful, like showing ongoing momentum of YouTube Shorts, not just a one-off and then you know the next 10 are dead and then another one, like consistently they're getting a, a, a certain high amount of baseline of views on their shorts and it's going up over time. Most all of those channels had published at least 200 YouTube shorts before they were at that point. I don't think I could ever do a 13 second shot and make it really valuable, but maybe that is the, the real skill, isn't it? To be able to tell stories. It's about just giving someone that quick dopamine hit right you know that's mm -hmm. that's how you see like eight second shorts and 13 second shorts that are that are performing well because that's like just enough time if you remember vine was like six seconds and that was it you know yeah. and and people became superstars from that just excellent storytelling in in the shortest amount of time possible youtube shorts does give you a minute and there's some fantastic shorts that i've seen that go up to a minute long that that really tell like a full and complete story and then sometimes i watch shorts that are so short and I just leave laughing and watching it multiple times and sharing it with people. Like both are valuable. You can take one idea and chop it up into a few different shorts and put all of the same shorts in the same feed if you want to. I love that idea. Because I think in many cases, if people want to go there, if, if YouTube creators want to go there and they've never put their hand at making a full video, a full story within 13 to, you know, to 60 seconds, it could be a really cool exercise to practice being able to tell something cohesive in that small amount of time. Ever since YouTube Shorts were launched, creators have suffered from a big problem. Yes, loads of people are watching my YouTube Shorts, but none of them end up watching my long form videos. Well, finally, finally, YouTube has a solution. And it looks like this. Uh.
That could have been implemented better. Stick around and I'll tell you what YouTube should have done, along with the steps you'll need to take to maximize what YouTube chose to go with. But first, we need to show you this. It's a relatively new analytic in the YouTube studio that shows you the distribution of views across different video formats. Now we did a full blown video on this analytic and the comments from that video exposed the struggle getting viewers from shorts to long form videos. I think the thoughts of the average YouTube creator would be summed up like this. The algorithm doesn't appear to encourage the discovery of cross platform content. You can either make long form videos or shorts and one type of content will be successful, but not both. However, the evidence here suggests creators do want to make both long form videos and shorts if they had the confidence that the content could be connected in some way. And so YouTube's answer to this is, sure, we can make that happen, do it yourself. And this is the feature that's going to make that happen. A persistent link in the YouTube short with the text taken from a long form video that if you tap on, will jump you straight to that video. To set this up in the YouTube studio, you need to go to the edit page of the YouTube short you want to add the link to and locate the related video option down the right hand side. From here, you can select what you want the short to link to. And it looks like you can choose any format of content, be it long form video, short or live stream. As far as I can tell, you can't yet do this from the YouTube Studio mobile app, but don't be surprised if you'll be able to do that in the future. And this feature is being rolled out to almost all creators. As you can see here on this new channel, I was blocked because I hadn't yet verified my account to unlock advanced features. This can be done at any time, but has criteria linked to it. But now for a really important question. Once you have linked your short to your long, how does YouTube track those views? Well, I did ask YouTube on Twix and they weren't very helpful. So I had to figure it out myself. This is a long form video I linked to from the short. And as you can see from the real time views, it's obvious when I set this up. And the majority of those extra views came from other YouTube features. Now then, get ready for some quick maths. The long form video benefited from around about 1400 views directly linked to the short. And the short itself in the same time period has got 12 and a half thousand views. So that's a link through rate of just over 10%, which sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Now there's a pretty good reason why this number was so high. The short was all about this new feature and it had a pretty big call to action to test. But if there is a link right here, by the time you see this video, give it a click and you'll be helping us out. Cheers. And all of a sudden, 11% of that YouTube audience is now aware of my long form content. Thank you, YouTube. This is the tool that makes sense and delivers results, but you could have done better because you see, there was a thing called YouTube stories where you could take a video link and actually post it on the video like a sticker. And that is far more clickable than a little bit of text at the bottom of a shot. I don't know why they didn't use that. To me, it feels like a missed opportunity. I'm just never happy, am I? I've always got an ax to grind with YouTube. Anyway. Here's three steps to take to get the best out of these new YouTube Shorts content links. The YouTube Short itself must provide value. It can't just be used as a trailer for the long form piece of content. Be very intentional and persuasive with the call to action. Tell them where they need to click and why. And don't link to another video in every single short because that's just going to irritate your regular viewers. This is going to be the key to solving one of the biggest problems YouTube creators have with Shorts, but not the biggest one. I've done it. I've finally hacked YouTube. I have figured out how to upload any custom thumbnail you want to your YouTube short. And this is how you do it. So you may already know this by now, but if you create a YouTube short through the mobile app, you can choose a single frame from the video to be your custom thumbnail for that YouTube short. But there are still problems with this. Obviously you're limited to the images in the video itself. And if you're on desktop, you can't even do that. No custom thumbnails whatsoever. And as far as we can tell, this is as good as it's going to get because YouTube said this in a recent YouTube update video. We don't have any plans to release the ability to upload fully custom thumbnails like on long form videos since the vast majority of shorts watch time comes from the feed where thumbnails are not shown. Now, this is actually really annoying for us because a lot of our YouTube shorts views actually come from search. So we'd love to show off those videos with custom thumbnails because currently they look garbage. So here's the 
unofficial way to upload a custom thumbnail to a YouTube short. I don't know how long this exploit's gonna last, and if it stops working, don't blame me. For this to work, you have to create the thumbnail at the same time you are making your short, and then add the custom thumbnail to the start of your video. It could be any length of time, maybe half a second. That ultimately is irrelevant, but it needs to be at the start of a video. Next, however you wanna do it, you need to get that video onto your mobile phone because from here, you can choose a custom thumbnail. From your phone in the YouTube app, create a short and then use a clip you just sent to your phone that has the custom thumbnail at the start of it. Once you get to the video detail screen, you can tap the pencil icon to select a thumbnail. Make sure you scrub over the timeline so that the thumbnail element of the video is selected. Add all of the other bits you need to and then you can upload the short to your channel. That will solve your YouTube short custom thumbnail dilemma. But now you've got a problem because you've got these extra frames at the beginning of your short. How are you gonna solve them? Back onto the computer. This is where in the video details of the short, you can take advantage of YouTube's built-in video editor. It includes a trim and cut function. So zoom into the video timeline as much as possible and then trim off any frames that include the thumbnail image. Make sure to save the changes and that should remove the evidence whilst keeping that custom thumbnail. As you can see on both the channel page and YouTube search pages, we have our custom thumbnail. Excellent. Although there is at least one problem with this solution. If you use a YouTube short feature like adding sound, this will prevent you from using the desktop video editor. It might apply to other YouTube short features too, so you may want to do some testing. And of course, you only get one chance. You can't change the thumbnail once it's uploaded to YouTube. This loophole could be fixed very quickly by YouTube, but my question to them is, why? Why are you making it so hard for us to upload custom thumbnails to YouTube Shorts? In preparation for this video, I did a poll on our community tab and more than two thirds would like the option to upload a custom thumbnail. Regardless of whether YouTube fixed this very specific problem with YouTube Shorts, we know we've just fixed all of your other problems with YouTube Shorts with this ultimate guide. But what about the YouTube algorithm? Yeah, we've got that sorted as well. The epic video is over here. Enjoy another hour of content.